excited. Lord, I just come before you. Um, Lord, I pray for this time. I pray that you would be glorified through the lives of um, the people that I'm going to speak about. Lord, I pray that um, you would help me to communicate well um, the message. Lord, I pray that today we would learn from those who've gone before us and that it would shape our hearts and minds as followers of you. In your name, amen. Well, that was great hearing the men's voices with ours, wasn't it, ladies, having you all here? Um, so today I'm talking about women of the Reformation. Now, some of you men might be like, oh, why did I even come? And there's a reason I didn't promote what I was talking about the first week. Um, and I, I, I wrestled through this thinking that um, even in our culture today, maybe women and their story isn't valued. So I want to encourage you, if you feel like, darn it, I can't believe I came, I, I pray that you will take a step back, take a deep breath, and think about what you might be able to learn from these women who played a very important part of our history. You just don't hear about them. Um, in the Reformation, you hear everything about who? White, Hess. Yes, Hess, White. You hear about Luther, Calvin, Wycliffe, all these people, right? But you don't often hear about the women who were a lot of the foundation and helped these men really go out and go forth and proclaim some of these truths, right? Um, some women, I, I have a row of books up here, and Phil brought a bunch of his biographies out, and then I have some of the ones I, I use for today. Um, if you're looking for anything to do, like, study on, these books are great. Um, I have a borrow a book, you know, from myself, come talk to me. Um, it's really good. I think I, I got into biography because I was in a book club with Melissa England here. It was a monthly book club, and we read seven women by, who's that by? Eric Metaxas, right? And my dad was reading Seven Men. I haven't read that one, by Eric Metaxas as well. So that's another great, those are, that's a great, um, those are two books by Eric Metaxas that are a great way to get into really learning about biography. Um, so why are we talking about women? Why? Well, think about this. How much of the population do women make up? Okay, around 50%, right? So they made up, they still do, 50% of the population. Had they not agreed with the Reformation, they surely could have stood against it. And when we only study the men, we really limit our understanding of a crucial time in our world's history. These are women that weren't just sitting around, they weren't just waiting for their husbands to do things. They were reading, they were writing, they were ruling. Some of the women that um, I talked about, especially in England, they were teaching children, they were housing refugees, um, they were balancing their husbands, um, some of them directed armies, confronted kings and judges, rebuked heretics. One thing I would caution against is seeing them as proto-feminists. And this is like modern day, I know it's, um, I believe it is the Chicago Press 
that in the last 10 years has put out some biographies and they are portraying some of these women as proto-feminists. And I would not look at them that way. That would be, I think that would not do them justice. They were pro-Jesus, they were pro-God's word, and they were thoughtful contributors to the advancement of the gospel. They weren't looking to promote their gender or even themselves. They wanted to promote God's word and the truth of God's word. They lived out the full scope of biblical womanhood, and they really do have a lot to teach us. Um, one of the studies that really um, stuck out to me was that the one on the German reformers. There are countless women that we'd love to know more of, but as you'll hear of what the women were doing in this day, they weren't writing about themselves. So there's not a lot of information, and there weren't other people writing about them because there were some incredible men that were doing some amazing things at that time, and they were the ones who were focused on, which is, is wonderful for us. Um, but the women were, along with the men, were facing persecution, martyrdom, exile. These were the standards in the 1500s. One of the things they sacrificed was safety and security. And I think about that and how that relates to me today. Um, if you've ever been without or you would feel like your security is gone, or if you've lost finances, right, you're losing security or safety, um, thinking about that, those are things that we don't tend to struggle with a lot. With these women and their families, they pave the way for us today to have the word of God in our very hands and definitely the freedom of religion that we experience today. Um, so in 1517, what happened in 1517? Anyone? Important year. There we go, right? That's when Luther posted the 95 thesis. And his, what he was trying to do was reform the Catholic Church. He wasn't trying to cause a big split. That wasn't his motivation. He wanted to reform the Catholic Church and have conversations about the indulgences, right? And then a few, a few years later, after it all sort of blew up, one of the things he, was, uh, he felt like was very important was to close the monasteries. And it was, that was fought against big time because a lot of the, or, and allowing priests to marry. So what was happening is a lot of priests were having their prostitutes on the side and in order to do this, all they had to do was just pay some money, and it would be okay, right? So without that money coming in, that's a big problem. So those are some of the things that have to do with Luther. Um, the reason I'm highlighting the contemporaries of people like Luther and Calvin is, is because this informs how we live today. I'm not a feminist. I am so far from that. Um, but I want to learn from their history, these women. And Hebrews talks about a cloud of witnesses, and we can learn from Abraham, right, and Isaac, and Gideon, and Moses, and all the people that are mentioned in Hebrews 11. And we can also learn from the recent Christians and how they lived in light of eternity. And by recent, it's crazy to think that some of these people, it was 500 years ago. That seems long ago but we're very connected in some ways to them. Um, these women played a prominent role in the Catholic and Protestant reform movements, and they really impacted the social order and the character of the family. The women's position in society, their role in the church was impacted big time in this. And as mon monasticism was eliminated, the priests began to marry. And some of this was seen as like a remedy for sin, so go ahead and get married. Um, whatever the case was, the domestic arena became the place where the Christian virtues were lived out, a place where character was schooled, uh, marriage became seen as a partnership, and in raising children in the fear of the Lord and working for his kingdom. And this was unifying in marriages, but there were also those who we will learn about who weren't unified, and you would have one going down one track and one down another, and if they didn't have that mutual commitment to the gospel, their marriage was greatly strained. Can we learn from that today? Absolutely, right? 
The Reformation women were often criticized and slandered uh, when their opinions left the safety of their homesteads. Not often, always, always slandered. Um, but there was this small, fearless group of women who broke these cultural barriers constantly. Um, they had this break in tradition, again, not to spotlight themselves, but for the sake of the gospel. In the 16th century, the average span of life was 25 years because of, this is average with the high infant mortality. So to replenish the population after all these devastating plagues, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, that started in the 1300s, the um, people were expected to have like families of 10 or more children. So this was encouraged. So due to this, what do you think the women were doing? They were busy, right? So they would spend one segment of their lives at home with their children, and then the next segment with their grandchildren, grandmothering. They were glad to be supported by the men, um, but it was a difficult time as a family unit. And a common assumption was that the women were just homebound, but that they were not into politics and literature. Um, and here's a great quote from one of the biographers said, whatever men said about women in these decades, they listened to them, they often yielded to them, and they allowed themselves to be governed by them, and they gave them little credit. It's sort of funny, right? Um, the role of women depended largely on their circumstance. Aside from women such as the queens and prince princes who had that automatic influence because of their role, um, the common women, like some of these Reformation women, they were known for their piety, their devotion to God, and not a ministerial role. Um, the women that I've spent a lot of time reading and learning, there's three women I'm going to focus on today. They were not from learned, um, well, one of them was, but they weren't as studied and learned as the men of their day. They didn't have all those opportunities, um, but they were steeped in the word of God, and they could battle anyone on scripture. Um, they could stand up against culture, political movements, and judges, and that's what we see in these women. Um, this took great courage and great risk. So Catherine Zell, she was the wife of Matthew Zell. Um, he was a reformer and he was actually a pastor and he was one of the first priests to ever marry. And he married Catherine who was in his congregation. Um, this was something, so Luther had declared in, in, I think it was 1520, that the clergy and monks should, allowed to be, should be allowed to be married. And when, when they were married, a lot of persecution came to Matthew. And so Catherine took it upon herself to write um, a big pamphlet on why it was okay for them to be married. And she used biblical references only. That is how she defended the marriage. Um, Catherine Zell, she was no stranger to loss. I'm going to speak more about her in a little bit as well. Um, she buried two children in infancy. Remember, we talked about the high mortality rate as well. Um, she never went on to have any more children. Um, she felt like that was um, God's displeasure on her, which is sad. Um, whereas a modern woman would go to the doctor and see how can this be corrected? What can we do to make this right? Um, she just took this and lived with this grief, and it informed a lot of the way that she lived. Um, to understand her, one must spend time with literature of her day, something that we, we I don't do a lot. I'm really just learning about. Um, the writings on women, I have been very surprised about. It's not, again, it's not about gender, um, which is how everything is written today, based on your gender, right, as far as women. Um, but it's about how people felt in every aspect of life. We can't just look to creeds is what she would have said, to understand the nature of our brothers and sisters. We can't, we can't just look to creeds to understand those who've gone before us, but we need to look at the context of their lives, their deaths, what united them, what divided them, what they hated, what they loved, what they misunderstood, what they understood. Uh, we have not just the institutes of the, Christi of the Christian religion by Calvin that we should be reading, but also letters and poetry from these days. The deepest anguish and joys are often seen in what the men and women, the husbands and wives would write to each other in their letters. 
and also the children to their parents. These were women of great courage. The last quote I put on your sheet there says, these women walked as seeing him that is invisible, sustained by faith, that somehow their toils and troubles had a place in the grand design. If there's any quote that I took from this, um, besides the one of Katie Luther, this really stuck with me about our purpose. Um, so moving on to Katie, Catherine Von Bora. She, everyone, most people have heard of her, Katie Luther. Um, she's the most widely written about. Her face is on the cover of this book. You may have it somewhere. This is her. I don't have any pictures of the other women. Um, they weren't well known enough to even have pictures of them. She was a nun, and when Luther's writings infiltrated the monasteries, she, along with nine other women, escaped. These nuns were on the run. So I, I believe it was like around Easter. I want to say it was Good Friday. Some, it was around Easter when Luther had organized a wagon to come steal the nuns, pick up these nuns so they could escape. It's hilarious, right? But you know, they were, they were convicted, not because of Luther, but because of the word of God. And, and like Katie, she was, a nun, she was in this monastery since she was five. So a lot of people, if they couldn't afford, you know, we have orphanages, monasteries, convents, right? So she was given to the work of the Lord at that young age she had lived there. Um, but she was convicted by the word of God. And what had to happen was these women need to quickly get married or they would be destitute. They had nothing, right? And so Luther arranged for a lot of their marriages. Um, and Catherine, he tried to arrange her marriage, or Katie, and it didn't work out the first time the guy married someone else. Um, and then it was like two years had gone on, and a woman named Arugula von Grumbach, who's my personal favorite, um, she is this Bavarian, she wrote to Luther and told him, basically, practice what you preach. You're talking about how, you know, the priests and the monks, and they could marry. Well, why aren't you married? And he was saying, well, I, I didn't, in his mind, he didn't want to get married. He knew that marrying him could be a death sentence, right? And it wasn't really his interest. But his views on his own marriage changed. And there's this great quote that Roland in, in one of his books says. Um, he said that as Luther thought about how it would please his father if he got married, his dad was not thrilled when he took his monastic vows. Um, he decided that it would please his father, rile the Pope, make the angels laugh and the devils weep, along with sealing his testimony. So he decided he was ready to marry. This was not a romantic decision. Um, the couples married during the Reformation for conviction or convenience. Right? So a woman could not support herself. Luther and Catherine, they married and they fell in love afterwards. He called her the morning star of Wittenberg. And he also told Katie that she would not, that if he were burned, that she would not escape his fate. And she was okay with that. Um, the Luthers had six children. And then during the plague, they took in, they didn't have the 10, right? Because during the plague, one of Luther's friends died, the wife died. And so they took in the four children of this family. So they ended up having these 10 children. So they had that, that magic number of 10. Um, one of the things to tell you about the plagues, this is one of the reasons I wanted to do this series, thinking about everything that's going on right now in our world. And, you know, we get so upset, like, oh, how come this is happening to us today? Well, let me tell you a little bit about the bubonic plague. Anyone know anything about that? In the 1300s, I have all this information written out about it. Um, it's this highly infectious disease. It's spread. I don't know that you need to know all this, but it's spread by fleas. Okay, so there was this infectious disease, and it would spread rapidly among communities in a short time. Therefore, it's called an epidemic, because that's what an epidemic is. And the Black Death, if you've heard of that, is the name of the first wave of the plague that swept across Europe in the 1300s. 
Um, the plague pandemics hit the world in three waves. So from the 1300s to the 1900s, okay, now we're pretty close to home, killed millions of people. The first wave, the Black Death, was 1347 to 1351. And then in the 1500s, there was a new strain of the disease. Sound familiar, right? The last pandemic um, was at the end of the 1800s across Asia. So what did they do in this time? They had medical inspections. Um, a doctor would come and inspect suspected cases and then would isolate the infected families and their homes. There would be isolation um, in plague hospitals and there were hospitals built throughout Europe. Um, one of the things that happened was there were ships that were restricted in their ports. And the Venetian authorities in, the 13, in 1347 would isolate the ships. So, question, who knows the Spanish word for 40? 40. So, what does that sound like? Quarantine. This is where this name comes from. The ships were isolated for 40 days. 40, right? Um, so that's how the control, the movement of goods was um, taken care of. So we see plague, problems, right? We can relate to that. Um, so Luther, they took in this friend's kids. They had 10 kids now. And what Luther would do is he was all about the word of God and making it known. Um, he would have given everything away all their money. He would have had just his daily bread. But Katie was pretty wise in that she would save money. And it's not that she would save it to hoard it, but they hosted people all the time. They ended up living in this Augustinian um, monastery. The Augustinian cloister is what it was called. And that's where Luther once lived as a monk. There were 40 rooms in it, and they would constantly host people. Uh, it, it's said by Katie that her greatest victory was to teach her husband to say no. I thought that was adorable. Um, Luther would try to force her to read God's word. And here's what she said to him. She did read his word a lot. And she said, I've read enough. I've heard enough. I know enough. Would to God I lived it. So they had this sort of like spunky, fiery relationship there. It was said that when she married Luther, she took a step into fame and a step down the social ladder by marrying him. Um, women like Catherine von Bora, they didn't write. She wasn't trying to have her voice heard. She was despised by her adversaries because she had a remarkable influence on Luther. So they hated her for it. She was widely criticized. Um, she is widely known. She is loved as a part of Reformation history by us. Um, she lived outside of cultural norms, though, and she suffered greatly for this. Much ridicule, much torment, and though she was protected by her husband, Martin, when he died, she was left to fend for herself. And widows in that day were always just destitute and often couldn't keep their children. She had to fight to keep her children when Luther died. Um, she had great tenacity, and there were a few sympathizers. A lot of times other reformers and their families would take in some of the wives and their children. Um, so Catherine Zell, I'm moving on to Catherine Zell, who I mentioned briefly, she was a contemporary of Katie Luther, and what she did is she was a writer. She would refute slander in pamphlets, and she had different published reputations supporting herself, supporting her husband, because it wasn't just him that had been excommunicated. It was he along with six other priests. So she was trying to defend them using only the word of God. Um, so they were married by Martin, how do you say his last name, Phil? Buser. Buser. Yeah, it's not spelled that way, but Martin Buser <laughs> is who married them, if you've heard his name, another reformer. And he'll come into play later on in her life. Um, the courage of Catherine and her written word, um, her letters were called smoking. And she also wrote songs and she wrote hymns. Again, this is not someone who was trying to make a name for herself. She was just living out the gospel in the only way that she knew how. Um, Catherine and Matthew, they housed Calvin when he was expelled from Geneva, um, along with an incredible amount of other reformers who were in hiding. 
Um, they were sympathizers. Matthew is probably one of the most liberal of the reformers. And they were sympathizers to the Anabaptists. And like some of his dying words were, you know, don't let them kill the Anabaptists. They really wanted to live more peacefully. Um, she entertained many of the delegates from Wittenberg and Saxony. Um, and Catherine was in full support of Matthew and encouragement to him. Um, they hosted refugees of the Reformation. Reformation. She visited those in prison. She helped those in the plague and carried out dead bodies. Um, after her husband passed away, their longtime friend, Bucher, Bucher, I cannot say his name, Bucer, um, this German reformer, he was writing and he encouraged another pastor to take her in because she would have been destitute, right? He said, and I wrote it in here, the widow of Arzell, a godly and saintly woman, comes to you that perchance she may find some solace for her grief. She is human. How does the Heavenly Father humble those endowed with great gifts? Her zeal is incredible for Christ lowliest and afflicted. She knows and searches the mysteries of Christ. Comfort her patiently for the love of her husband, a sincere and faithful servant of Christ, even if, like the rest of us, he did not perfectly fulfill all that he might. I love that quote. I mean, to me, it is so beautiful to see the, these men of the Reformation supported the wives. They saw the great cost that it was to them as well. Um, what she did when she visited those affected by the plague is she would spend time with them. She would um, spend time with those under the sentence of death. There was a, um, a delegate that was in the hospital that had leprosy and she was the only person. Somehow she made her way in to visit him and spent time ministering to him. She was called a disturber of the peace when she committed herself to Lutheranism. And there, there are these great quotes about her, but at the end of it, her reply in 1955, she said, I've never mounted the pulpit, but I have done more than any minister in visiting those in misery. Is this disturbing the peace of the church? So that is the legacy that Catherine Zell leaves. There's so much more. So we talked about Katie Luther had this household of children. Catherine Zell um, had no children. She had a wonderful marriage. Um, and now we come to Argela von Grombach, who did not have a wonderful marriage. She did have children, and her struggle was that her partner in marriage was not thrilled at her using her voice and her writing. Um, she, he was not on board with her spiritually, and he suffered a lot because of her um, speaking up. He was Catholic, um, and... He was fired from one of his jobs because he couldn't keep her quiet. Um, Argola was Bavarian, and she was a contemporary of these other women, and she was empowered in her own words by a school of women. So as we talk about a cloud of witnesses, when I hear that phrase, a school of women, I automatically think of Argola von Bork, because Argola, sorry, I said von Bork, um, von Grombach. Um, I immediately think of her because she knew that she was surrounded by other women who were fighting for the same cause, who were risking their very lives. So in some ways, she didn't feel so alone, even though her marriage was a very, very lonely place to be. Um, so growing up in Bavaria, she, she was given a Bible by her father at the age of 10, and she devoured that. Her and her mother devoured that Bible. Um, she had an education, but it wasn't to the level of some of the men in her society. She didn't know Latin, and she always, I think, struggled with not knowing Latin, wanted to know more. Um, one of the things she wrote was, where I have written on my own, did I put this in here? No. Where I've written on my own, a hundred women would emerge to write against them, for there are many who are able and better read than I am. As a result, they might well come to be called a school of women. So that came from her very mouth. There was this um, true sense that silence was not a luxury that they could afford. Um, this was not a way that they could live. Um, the doctrine was typically left to the male reformers to defend. 
And in times when the women needed to speak more, they would step in quite courageously and defend the faith. And she repeats the words of Paul in 1 Timothy about how women are to be silent in church. And she concludes with, but when no man will or can speak, I am driven by the word of the Lord when he says, he who confesses me on earth, him will I confess. And he who denies me, him will I deny. And she took that from Matthew 10 and Luke 9. She did have initially this level of protection from her adversaries uh, because she was married. But as I said, her husband was ashamed of her actions. Um, his lack of biblical conviction and his lack of alignment with the Protestant thinking, it was a barrier throughout their marriage. Argola had a steadfast commitment and confidence from the teachings of the Bible. But as she continued to try to advance the cause of the Reformation, as you can imagine, this drove a deeper wedge between her and her husband. There was no collective group of women, like I said, fighting to be heard just to be a woman. They were fighting to be heard for the sake of the gospel. They were operating individually, but there was this group that believed in this cause of the Reformation, and they would fight for it, and they knew that their lives were in danger. What they feared was God. They did not fear man. They knew that they were at risk, and they wanted to be true to God's word. Um, in, the medieval, in the medieval world, there was a place for women in religion. There were mystics, there were visionaries, there were saints, and they led as spiritual mothers. Well, these were all dismissed by the Protestants. So with the Reformation, this new time, this new vocation in the home was um, emerging for women. And let me explain it a little bit. The priesthood of all believers, okay? This was this common theme from scripture that was brought home to the Protestants, that you too can have the word of God in your hands. It wasn't reserved only for an actual priest. So women were valued with a central role in their home as helpmates, as mothers, raising their children with godly principles, caring for their husbands, and showing hospitality. This was seen as a great and noble calling. And my, how times have changed, right? Um, they were raising these godly leaders of tomorrow. Um, there wasn't that visible role in any type of spiritual leadership. But this was seen, if you would ask like a Luther and a Calvin, this was elevating the role of women and promoting the sense that this ordinary mundane life in the home was a wonderful and high calling, a way to serve God. So while, li while women were liberated in some ways and encouraged as men were to hold the word of God in their hands, in their hearts and minds, only the men could serve as voc vocational ministers. So the determination of all these Protestant women can be, can be attributed to God's word shaping them. And in Argola's case, her pen. She was the most famous female Lutheran pamphleteer. So the pamphlets, that is how any information got out. She was writing to friends, to family, to preachers, to other leaders of her day. She had this great relationship with Luther where they would write back and forth letters and it's really beautiful how he taught her from his letters, and she would eat it up. This was the 1500s version of distance education, I believe. Um, she, she was one of eight children, and she was privileged, benefiting from this distinguished family and a private education, religious teaching. Um, she studied that Bible. It's the Koberger Bible. The Ger any Germans here would know what that is, maybe? Um, and then she served in the royal court, as a lady in waiting. And while she was there, she was 15 or 16, she met Johann von Staupitz. I'm sure I said that wrong. I did take German, but Johann was a Roman Catholic theologian. Does anyone know who he's the spiritual father to? Luther. Amazing, right? So that's the connection there with Luther. And that's where her association, her interest in him, and the familiarity with his teaching began. Um, but her spiritual formation, it wasn't limited to, to theoretical concerns. She also struggled in her privileged life and her upbringing. The plague came and took both of her parents. So she lost her parents at a young age. Um, they died within five days of each other. So she was now under the guardianship of her uncle. 
And seven years later, he was executed when he was thought to have plotted politically. He was executed. Um, and during the same year as the death of her uncle, what's she going to do? She gets married. And she marries Friedrich von Grumbach. So they had four children, and Argola raised them in the Protestant faith. Um, there is this great evidence of the value of these women being home and seeing themselves as the priesthood of all believers, that she was raising her kids in the Protestant faith to know God's word. She also handled the finances of her family. Um, but she had this tumultuous marriage. Um, they were house divided, and her husband was often targeted. Uh, but she did not back down at this time in her life. She was called some horrible, horrible things throughout her life. Um, and one of the things she's known for is that because she was connected to the Catholics, they lived in Lenting, which is near the University of Ingolstadt. And Johann Eck was the pro-chancellor in this time. Um, and in this time, there was an 18-year-old who was um, basically on death row. He was about to be burned because he had, was found with Lutheran um, paraphernalia. And that was against the law at this time, so he could be killed for that. And so what she did was um, she wrote this letter, and it had more than 80 scripture references in it. And she basically chastised them for not following God's law. And what she says is, by the way, he eventually recants and they allow this kid to be released because he denies his faith. His father got him to deny his faith. But as she wrote this letter, no one else stood up for this young student. And she knew that people wanted to kill her because she wrote this letter and never heard a reply. She says, I hear that some are so angry with me that, that they do not know how best to speed my passage from life to death. But I know for sure that they cannot harm me unless the power to do so has been given them by God. He will keep me safe for his name's sake. She wondered, I would dearly like to know what they have to gain if they were to murder me right now. Then again, she saw an opportunity to witness and martyrdom. I am persuaded too that if I am given grace to suffer death for his name, many hearts would be awakened. This was in her open letter to the town and the council of Ingolstadt. And this university took in public funds. She, she was saying, you guys are abusing the funds and the power that you have. And she called them out on this. And this is when her husband lost his job. Um, she was also in contact with Melanchthon um, and she couldn't get enough of the teaching of, of these guys. Um, at one point, she also wrote an open letter to defend Melanchthon and Luther, and she says, What do Luther or Melanchthon teach you but the word of God? You condemn them without having refuted them. For my part, I have to confess in the name of God and my soul's salvation that if I were to deny Luther and Melanchthon's writing, I would be denying God and his word. Again, it's not about Luther and Melanchthon. It's about God and his word. Um, this distance learning, this was equipping women to lead their households, communities, and to support their husbands. Though a Luther-type figure, he wouldn't come right out and defend her. He would privately write these letters. He would see that as a, a way to um, that wasn't advancing the cause of the Reformation. If he would defend her, would, he felt like that he would backtrack the cause of the Reformation, which is sort of sad. But again, I didn't live in that day, so I don't know what that was like. Um, so she absolutely knew who she was. Um, she knew what her purpose in life was and there was no swaying her. Another quote I put on here by her was, I have no Latin, but you have German. Being born and brought up in this tongue, what I've written to you is no woman's chit chat, but the word of God. And I write as a member of the Christian church against with the gates of hell cannot prevail. How awesome that would be if we all could write and speak with such conviction, right? Um, she defended some of the, um, she defended Luther again and Melanchthon to the Duke of Wilhelm, uh, to the Duke, Duke Thering in 1523. Um, she would blast these, these guys and tell them that the word of God was not Luther's, but it was God's word. Um, and in that, that long letter that she wrote to Ingolstadt, she used over 80 scriptures in it. 
And that's all she did. She wasn't trying to put her name out there, but sort of accidentally she became a bestseller and thousands and thousands of her written work, her writings were published. Um, over 10,000 people, it said, read that. And her focus was on the true gospel being preached. Um, she wrote to Frederick the Wise, uh, imploring him to be faithful to the gospel. Can you imagine Frederick getting that? Okay, lady, right? But there was something about her words and the way that she wrote that greatly impacted people. And I believe it was the Lord, definitely. Um, she didn't receive any replies to her letters. She was the first Protestant woman to lobby and to use her influence to assist the impoverished and to empower the lay people. Um, there was a long time when we don't hear anything about her. We don't know if it's because of her extreme persecution um, or the instability with her husband, but she sort of disappears for a little while. Um, and then she resurfaces as she shows up at the Diet of Augsburg to hang out with the reformers, which is sort of funny. Um, she was showed great respect by these reformers who were there meeting. And we don't know much about her life. Um, it's thought that she lived till 1563, 1564, um, and potentially that she died a martyr. So she is listed in Rabbis' History of the Martyrs. Well, we're not sure if it's the same. I think that's been speculated. Um, she's long been forgotten. She's not really well known. And part of that's probably because Bavaria remained Catholic and because she was a woman. Um, and great censorship began to happen. So a lot of her works, all of her works were banned. But the greatest contribution of Argola is this organic school of women that we are a part of. Uh, obviously men and women, if I'm talking about the cloud of witnesses, right? Um, but as women, we are to pour ourselves into our families to be the spiritual teachers to our children. Um, and few would speak out against the ungodliness in society. So we are also called to do that. Um, one of the things of her contribution is the advancement of women in education as well. Um, she was disciplined. She had to pursue this educational material through her letters, uh, but she taught in her own home and she also taught those around her through letters. So she didn't just take in, she also taught. Um, some of the things about her contemporaries who married reformers, they were in these better positions peacefully. Um, and she wasn't, she was always um, really in a difficult relationship with her husband. And even when she died, she even when he died, she married again. Um, and that was brief and, and he died as well. Um, she contributes to the church today by showing us to stand, how we stand for the church, for God's word, no matter what the cost. And it's easy for us to wanna to take the word and mold it around to whatever the culture wants us to say, how we can maybe fit into culture. But this is evidence that that is not who we are called to be. Argola would push us all to the word of God, to going back to God's truth, to know it, to spend time in it, to seep in his word. A call to God's people, to us who sit on the sidelines at times because we fear we don't know enough, right? That is a call to us. She herself admitted she didn't know Latin. There were others who knew more than her, but she did not let it hold her back. Um, her name would not be known or credited like a Luther or a Calvin, but her life speaks loudly in the scripture in 1 Corinthians saying, God uses the weak things of the world to shame the strong. And she was anything but weak, but the scripture attests to the fact that God will get his message across no matter what. Um, and so as some of these women, this resurfaces, these hidden figures of the 16th century, I think they are just the sort of women we today need to emulate and also respect in history, right? Um, and the most daunting call to all of us is to honor and obey God faithfully in the ordinary and the mundane. I think that that's something I want to leave you with is how are you called right where you are to live out the gospel of God in your ordinary, in your daily life. Um, this is the everyday faithfulness through each of you, through me, that grows churches, transforms communities, turns families inside out, changes nations. And we get to be a part of that. So we are 
are to be that light in the world. So I want to encourage you and leave you with that. And um, that's all I have for you. Is that quick? A little quick? Um, yes. Yep. Uh, that's a, no, is that error? Uh, oh, did I write the wrong? I'm oh, sorry yeah. about that. Okay. No, but you know what's, sorry, I wrote the wrong thing on there. But you know what is interesting about these women, if you think about it, they were like in their like 18, 19, 20, 25, when they were really um, in the heat of, of their day. Like they were young and unafraid, right? In the risks that they took. Um, Katie was, yep. And so you said that they, they escaped, and why, why were they escaping? Uh, well, because they weren't allowed to leave the convent. Well, yeah, they were confined by the jail there. Yeah, and that's who took care of them, and they also profited from them, you know? And was Martin with them. Yeah, he organized the escape. Gotcha. Is it 52? Sorry, guys. So... Do you see that error there? 1499 to 1552. Thanks for catching that. And so the quote for Catherine Zell, it's, uh, it says the widow of Catherine Yeah, so that's by Martin. He wrote that. And he's writing defending. So Matthew had died. But Matthew was very famous in his time, but she emerges as being more famous in history. Hmm. Do you think she was more famous in history? I don't think either of them were really that famous in history. Yeah. 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 He, they were faithful. They were very faithful ministers to God's word and saw themselves as a partnership in the gospel. Yeah, I would say that, um, you know, a lot of this is about resourcing. And so I think it's five, I don't think, at the 500th anniversary, uh, in 2017, if you want a desiring God website, actually John Piper and several other people did one page biography of like all the pre reformers and reformers, men and women. Uh, we tend to focus on Germany, right? We still give a lot about Germany. Or England, and, yeah. And, and it was yeah. at the center of it before you get to the Reformation. Right. But he covers like Italy, he covers everywhere. He does these like one page biographies for a full month. That I would encourage you to go and um, they'll give you, uh, you know, again, we know like a handful, most of us, the big names, but there were so many mm -hmm. people who um, were part of this that no man, one, one or two people stand as a voice, of, the collective voice, but I think he gives us a broad swap of men and men and women that we're unfamiliar with, which is incredibly helpful to receive, mm -hmm. to like the Zells and, um, Von Rumbach. Yeah, all that. Yeah. Someone asked me if lettuce was named after her. Who was that? Arugula. Uh, is it like, um, just, actually, just type in um, uh, a Catherine Zell or Katarina Von Rumbach, and then you'll, it'll pull up the whole thing. Mm -hmm. I think at one point we, post, we started posting them on our Instagram. The daily, like it was, it was four years ago, but we were posting them. Um, the daily mm -hmm. on Facebook and Instagram. So, so Katie was in there. Ooh, which by the way, can I put a plug? This is why we encourage you to do a social media, not because of like, ooh, because 